can generative AI improve the healthcare experience for patients and for clinicians? Can we relieve clinician burnout and also improve patients' clinical outcomes with these new tools? I'm Dr. Kirsten Bibbins-Domingo, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of JAMA and the JAMA Network. This conversation is part of a series of videos and podcasts hosted by JAMA in which we explore the issues surrounding the rapidly evolving intersection of AI and clinical practice. Today, I'm joined by Dr. John Ayers, a faculty member at the University of California, San Diego, and the Vice Chief of Innovation in the Department of Medicine at UCSD. He's also the Deputy Director for Informatics at the Altman Clinical and Translational Research Institute. Dr. Ayers has conducted research on the use of online data to detect behavioral trends and how new Gen AI programs like ChatGPT can answer medical and public health questions. Welcome, Dr. Ayers. Thank you for having me. Great. Um, well, I'm really uh, happy to have a chance to talk with you because you published an article now uh, a little a few months ago um, in JAMA Internal Medicine that became quite popular. Um, and it became quite popular because it seemed to imply that ChatGPT was even better and more empathetic than physicians at answering patients' questions. Tell me about that study. Well, when we saw, you know, our, our study was problem induced. And the problem we were trying to resolve was patient messages. You know, CMOs everywhere are getting complaints. You know, we know about burnout. Part of that is this overburdened workload and, and a big driver of that is patient messages. And so we want to see if, you know, chat GPT in its early form of 3.5 could answer patient questions and, and do so in a way where we compared its ability to answer questions in terms of quality and empathy to actual doctors. And so the, the first barrier we had to cross was getting the data. And so instead we turned to where patients were already seeking care and that was on social media, on Reddit, a forum called Ask Docs, where hundreds of thousands of people submit questions and a licensed healthcare professional, in this case, a physician, uh, will provide a response anonymously and free of charge and do so rather quickly uh, through crowdsourcing techniques. And we downloaded that data and we had you know, real patient questions and real physician responses. And then we compared those two responses generated by ChatGPT. Uh, our panel of healthcare professionals themselves were four times more likely to prefer the response written by ChatGPT to one written by an actual physician. Uh, they were four times more likely to judge the response as being very good or good in quality compared to physicians. And they were 10 times more likely to judge a response as empathetic or very empathetic compared to actual physicians. And so it showed that this tool that exists can not only help us with our process, Maybe it's something that can help answer the many of questions that patients have that may now be going unanswered. And how do we integrate this now into healthcare in a way to evaluate it rigorously to see how it changes patient outcomes and how it improves how we have a physician uh, patient relationship and we can enhance that with AI generated messaging? Yeah, so interesting. I remember when the study came out and some of the people who, you know, when studies come out, they gather a lot of attention. This one certainly did because ChatGPT, this uh, tool, this uh, computer is uh, seems more empathetic than the, the physician, at least in, in the way you've measured it. People were critical. This isn't really like me when I'm in clinic answering for patients. The doctors would do something different. Uh, but one of the interesting things you point out is we don't collect um, data on, on most of the things that we're doing in healthcare right now. No, we certainly don't when it comes to messaging, although that's changing. You know, our goal was to try to improve patient outcomes. We're saying that these tools are ready to be evaluated and evaluate it in randomized control trials. You know, I would argue that for some patient subpopulations, like consider like a, a post-MI heart failure patient, I know what their survivability is. I know what their survivability is and how it's attenuated by their lifestyle choices, you know, by their adherence to clinical feedback and by representing themselves as their symptoms evolve so we can update their care. I know that's gonna reduce it. Messaging is a pathway to impact those outcomes. 
So let me say back what I hear you saying. So you're saying when we focused on what got a lot of attention, uh, the, the, you know, doc in the box, uh, chat GPT is more empathetic than the real life doc answering your, your text message. Um, that wasn't the point. The point was that these, these messages do well, and that might be a way to make sure that patients get their questions answered uh, and might, in fact, relieve a burden on uh, physicians, which you say was one of the motivating factors factors and that uh, it's time to test them whether they're whether they do in fact help in in improving patient outcomes would that be a fair summary I think that'd be a fair summary that's what our value add was was trying to show a use case where you can use these and, and potentially impact patients in a positive way and it goes back to the 2019 JAMA study that we did where we coined the term crowd diagnosis where you know millions of people are so desperate for access to clinical care uh, that they go online, like public social media, and post, you know, very sensitive medical questions and hope someone somewhere, most often not an expert, will give them an answer. And so really we want to help, you know, that bottleneck of improving access to care. And, you know, if a, a doctor working with GPT can get more access to care and, and better serve patients, uh, let's do it. Well, you started by saying you were motivated by clinician burnout and some of those factors, but you've really put a stake in the ground for patient outcomes. Um, when you think about messaging, what types of studies should we be looking at? What, what types of outcomes really matter where, for, for this type of technology just around the messaging piece? Just around the messaging piece, I still think we should focus on clinical outcomes. Uh, you know, I think, you know, it changes the reality of the situation. Uh, we could also modify the way we think about patient, you know, patient uh, provider communication. Uh, we can change the inbox, not just into where we receive and respond, but we can change it into an outbox. You know, during COVID, we all got those, you know, blunt automated messages like, you know, your booster is ready, right? Are, are you doing things to protect yourself? And a lot of times we muted those, right? Because they they weren't tailored to us or they weren't relevant to us. And so we turned it off. You know, now we have the potential to actually communicate with patients using, you know, personalized data based on their electronic health record and send proactive, proactive messages to them instead of us waiting for a need to occur and then respond to that need. It really changes the dynamic of the way patients and providers are going to interact when you think about, you know, AI-assisted messaging. And when you um, tell me a little bit about what um, you all at UC San Diego or in other studies that you've done, how you think about disclosure to patients about where, what's generating these messages. Do patients know that this comes, comes from, uh, is an AI generated message? Do, uh, how much do, does a message that comes to me as the physician and I edit it, what, what should a patient know about any of that? They currently disclosed that the original message was uh, generated by AI and that it was enhanced, you know, it's, it, to use the, the, you know, the AI term, it's a doctor in the loop, right? So we have the doctor in the loop where you have generated content and then the doctor is, you know, refining, editing and elevating that content before sending it to the patient. Patients don't understand how messaging works now because it's not your doctor responding most of the time, right? It's a nurse you know, or it's a, a medical assistant who's responding to the message, who's triaging the message. And so we spend a, a huge amount of human capital on just triaging messages to identify the subset that are urgent, uh, to identify the subset that, you know, we will eventually respond to maybe in a day, maybe in two days. And so, you know, automating those resources can free up that human capital. Uh, to then be used on actually helping patients. So providers and nurses and medical assistants can spend less time on verb noun conjugation and more time actually dealing with the heart of medicine, you know, providing evidence-based and informed and persuasive clinical feedback to the patient. Hmm. Uh, that's great. And so the, the, then the take home, what I should take away about the fact that ChatGPT scored higher on the empathy scores is that the draft that's coming back for me to the review as the doc in the loop is something that um, that patients would like to read and and uh, and would be comfortable reading, and that I might be editing for content for something else, but it, it it's it's a pretty good first start at that. Yeah, I think what you're seeing here is just simply the limitations of a human provider versus an AI that never fatigues is always available. And you see that both in terms of the quality metric and the empathy metric. You know, take an example of one of the questions in our study was a, a patient 
uh, had swallowed a toothpick and they were concerned about, you know, they might have a puncture and bleed and what should they do? And the physician rightly responded, that's a very unlikely outcome, don't worry about it. But the, the AI was able to reveal all the considerations that went into that same response. You know, like the likelihood of this happening is this. And if you have these symptoms, then you might want to go to the ER and talk to them. But don't worry, toothpicks aren't going to hurt you. And, you know, echoing back that the patient was concerned and that the patient, you know, felt worried and understanding that, you know, doctors are trying to persuade patients to do what's in the patient's own self-interest, even though everything's pulling them in the other direction. And so, you know, really, you know, we can start thinking about not only what is good content for messaging, but what types of messages are potentially the most persuasive? And we can do that by looking at clinical endpoints, for example. Oh, I like that. So um, so more persuasive, but I, I really like, and you've heard said this now several times, we don't just want to know that it was more persuasive. We want to think about the outcomes we actually care about in the end, which, which really is the, the clinical outcomes for patients. Um, our goal is not to um, use what could be very powerful tools to... Um, try to achieve a certain type of behavior, but ultimately what we want to do is to achieve the better outcome for the patient. You know, our studies showed that a tool not designed for healthcare delivery, uh, not fine-tuned for healthcare, and now is severely antiquated to current models that are available, uh, was already better than physicians in practice. You know, physicians who were voluntarily wanted to be there, wanted to help people, wanted to respond, unlike, you know, some of us who don't want to be there. It's been a long work day, right? And don't want to respond. Uh, and so it, it could already do better. I, I think, you know, there's a huge potential here, particularly when these systems get access to EHR, AI that can help extract information for them and, and generate, you know, action points, uh, much like we do now with flowcharts, you know, and action items uh, can do that uh, for messaging too. I think it's, it could be a game changer for healthcare. So one of the things that you um, you work both in the in the space of AI in clinical practice, but also AI in public health, and um, and I wonder whether those you see the potential for AI as a tool to facilitate communication. Are those different challenges when we're talking about public health messaging, um, or or the same things in different contexts? Public health is really complicated. Um, you know, on the one hand, we spend more on public health now than ever before. Uh, there's more MPHs and PhDs graduating. Uh, there's more deans out there in medicine trying to figure out how to start a school of public health. Yet life expectancy in the United States is declining. And, you know, thinking about AI in a way where it can help elevate what we do and from a public health communication standpoint uh, should be prioritized uh, potentially for study. We did a small scale study on, you know, uh, AI, generative AI for public health type questions where people are asking about, you know, suicide or addiction or uh, other issues that we typically think about as behavioral medicine, which is the public health side, you know, the leading drivers of premature mortality. And, and we showed that you know, ChatGPT worked well there. And, and so, you know, thinking about, you know, how these tools can like, what's the suicide hotline look like? You know, what's the smokers hotline look like in the future? Uh, you know, what does access and utilization of those resources, you know, does utilization of those resources change the outcome? Uh, you know, that's the types of studies I think we should be doing in public health. You know, really, you know, now we have the opportunity to, you know, deliver precision messaging. Uh, our main tool for impact in public health is our voice, is how we communicate to people. And now we have a technology that can not only expand the speed at which we can speak to people, but can tailor it to people. I think that's going to be a, a huge opportunity for public health. And maybe we can reverse the downward trend in life expectancy that we experience when public health has become more and more salient. You know, how do we change those outcomes? And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of what we do now, we don't know if it works. So we have all these resources that exist. We need to start critically thinking about, you know, are they working? and then think about how we can use AI tools to make them work better. And, and that would be an outcome we could achieve in public health maybe. Right, so uh, that sounds challenging, and it sounds both compelling, you make the compelling case, but challenging, just as you suggest. You know, I don't know the equivalent of the doc in the loop on the public health messaging, where really our goal is, um, is the large-scale messaging to meet, to meet, reach a number of people 
you it's you make a very compelling case about tailoring because I know from the personal experience of doing trying to do public health messaging that that's exactly what you need. Um, but thinking about how to study AI for these types of outcomes for a suicide hotline or for a smoker's quit line, um, it, it wouldn't wouldn't be that easy. I think, you know, AI is one of these things where it's like it's easy to get excited about it. And it's also easy to understand it's very limited. And so fortunately, we have the tool uh, to resolve what the value add is for AI in healthcare and in public health. And that is science, you know, and that is investing in rigorous studies uh, that have clinical endpoints that ask the question, are we helping to fix the problem? Yes or no. And, and so we, we can either rely on that tool or we can, you know, ignore it as so often we do in other settings and, you know, we'll either make a difference or we won't. You know, our study, you know, obviously was followed up on patient messaging. Now I know of scores of healthcare centers working with different industry partners uh, to provide messaging. I don't know if any of them are focused on clinical endpoints. You know, they're all focused on process indicators. And so we, we, we really need to understand that the value added to this tool is going to be limited by the quality of the science we put into it. And that's not, that's not true just for messaging. That's true of all of AI and healthcare and public yeah, it's health very, as well. Very compelling what you're saying um, uh, and uh, very compelling what you're saying. So there's been a lot of talk recently when we're having this conversation, uh, uh, the president uh, and the White House have just announced uh, sort of their, their plan uh, to think about uh, address their framework for thinking about AI in the U.S., um, I, I just love your comments on what your first reaction is to that and whether it's focused in the right place and uh, and how we ensure, more importantly, the focus, what you're talking about to continue to push us to focus on the clinical outcomes or the public health outcomes or the outcomes that we care about and the problem we're trying to solve. Yeah. I mean, for our listeners, you know, the White House executive order on AI also instructed health and human services uh, to develop AI-specific regulatory regimes uh, by late April of 2024. Uh, those, that prescription did not outline any specific actions that should be taken by HHS, but it did highlight and talk about some of the issues that they were interested in in terms of outcomes. And unfortunately, I believe the White House was concerned more with process, and they didn't talk any about patient outcomes. And I think that's a reflection of what the FDA has been doing uh, for the last several years. You know, they've been working on a machine learning and AI for, you know, medical devices. And if that regulatory framework is still not yet developed, even though it's been years in the making, and now we need a regulatory framework in April, you know, you can use a, a sepsis detection tool as a, a clinical decision support, and that tool will never be evaluated uh, for clinical endpoints to see if it actually improves the likelihood of survivability in the patient. Instead, we're evaluating it for, does the code look good? Uh, does it, is it safe? Uh, is it equitable? And yes, I, I care about those things, but if I'm in that ICU, I want to get out of there alive. That's the outcome I want. And so our message to the White House is, and regulators is, you know, focus on clinical endpoints. But as we study these clinical endpoints, then we'll learn about these other secondary safety signals. And we can de define proscriptive rules to prevent events like that from happening before. So let's move away from a regulatory regime of stop signs and guardrails, because whatever you write today is gonna to be medieval in a year. Let's instead set the goal line of what AI should achieve. Like I would wanna use as a very rigorous endpoint of you know, similar to you know, how the FDA regulates devices and drugs like you know, feel, function, survivability, or we could lower that benchmark, but let's, let's at least agree that we want to have clinical outcomes uh, driving whether or not we give people access to this market. Regulators are the ones that have to hold industry and healthcare centers feet to the fire uh, to put patients first. If you announced, for example, that for AI to be integrated into the electronic healthcare record, uh, into your EHR platform, be it Epic or whatever, that it has to have demonstrated clinical endpoints to show that it works, that improves patient outcomes. And in doing so, it allows us to see studies where they're controlled, they're randomized. And, and so we can see the ancillary consequences of delivering these tools. We can see how they adversely impact equity. We can see how they adversely impact safety. Uh, we can see how then we can design these 
you know, guardrails and stop signs, but let's not start with the guardrails and stop signs. Let's start with the goal line. Mm -hmm. I like it. I was going to ask you what types of studies you want to see in JAMA, but I think you've pretty much made it clear that the types of studies JAMA usually likes to publish, which is on uh, the clinical endpoints and the outcomes, that should be the gold standard. Just because we have a new technology here shouldn't change where the goal line is. That's right. That's right. And I think the goal line now is far more feasible. You know, we're talking about tools that are digitally delivered. And so you could design studies that deliver these across, you know, diverse patient populations, multi-center studies, and across patients in mass where you can detect, you know, these endpoints within weeks. And you don't need to do a small scale single study where it takes a year or two. I think, you know, really what AI can do in terms of not disrupting how we think about evidence is make evidence more abundant because now we have a tool that we can evaluate and wrap and with some rapidity uh, that could impact patient outcomes. And that's, that's really unique. And, and so let's do it. I love it. I love it. Well, John, it's been such a pleasure uh, speaking with you and um, looking forward to, to more of your work in the future. And uh, it, it's a very interesting time, but I love the, the focus on, on the clinical outcomes. Thank you. I appreciate having me. And to our audience, thank you for watching and listening, as well as giving us feedback on this series. We also welcome submissions in response to JAMA's AI and medicine call for papers. Until next time, stay informed and stay inspired. We hope you'll join us for future episodes of the AI and clinical practice series. Subscribe to the JAMA Network YouTube channel and follow JAMA Network Podcasts wherever you get your podcasts.